We're ready to get into the God's word this morning. Woo! Yes. Come on, Dad. Oh, oh. The word. Well, uh, I'm very excited to jump into part two of studying out his miraculous signs. Uh, I just want to give it up for all the incredible speakers this morning. Uh, Alex for presenting. Heidi, he did a great job. And Heidi, uh, just sharing an incredible yes. communion that brought us to the foot of the cross. Uh, I got emotional a couple times uh, through it. Uh, I certainly was moved by your story. And obviously, thank you, Gordons, for sharing your convictions yeah. about contribution. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's hard when, when you give your contribution uh, when, when you're given out of what you don't have. But, but that's a great heart. God, God will always honor that type of heart. And uh, I'm very grateful for your friendship and your love. And I'm just excited for baby Oe to come and join us uh, and uh, grow up in an incredible church family. The title of the lesson this morning, you got to believe it to see it. You got to believe it to see it. The first point that I have for you this morning Faith that closes the on, distance. Mm. Faith that closes the distance. Turn with me to John chapter 4 in verse 46. Up, bro? So this is the second miracle recorded in the book of John. Last week we studied out Jesus turning wine or water into wine at a wedding in Cana. And uh, since then, he's been traveling throughout the countryside, preaching the word. And uh, even he's growing his ministry so much that all these religious leaders from Jerusalem are hearing that Jesus is gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, who had been baptizing all over the countryside. And that made them nervous. And Jesus comes back to Canaan with all this uh, incredible news about his ministry and this reputation about all the incredible things he's done throughout the countryside. And in verse 46, it says, Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man had heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. We'll stop right there. You know, Jesus walks back into Canaan. And this royal official who heard about Jesus' ministry comes and begs him to heal his son. Now, it's interesting. The last sign that we looked at, it was that Mary, the mother of Jesus' request, so it was done at a mother's request. The next sign, the next miracle was done at a father's request. So I thought that was quite interesting. But let's examine the man. Most likely this man was a royal official to a member in the royal household. And we know that he was desperate, right? Because he goes and he finds Jesus. And back in the day, they didn't have Twitter or Facebook. They couldn't update the location of Jesus just by sending out a tweet. <laughs> this guy had to actually find Jesus, ask where his whereabouts are, who his people are, where his people are. He was really desperate. And, you know, I think about this man, and I imagine my son. And if he was sick or hurt, how desperate I would be. I mean, can you imagine being this father and knowing your son was on his deathbed? Can you imagine the fear and desperation? Have you ever been desperate before? 
for? You know, desperation is a powerful motivator. And I believe God uses desperation in our lives to create a need for Jesus. What's even more significant about this man is most likely he was an official in Herod Antipas' household. Now, Herod is, is an interesting guy in the Bible because he was known for killing John the Baptist. And he was the main ruler of the area in Jesus' time. So if that's true, he was part of an upper class who did not believe that Jesus was a Messiah or a prophet because that would directly come into conflict with Herod's right to the throne, even though he shared rule with three other rulers in the area. So they treated Jesus and John the Baptist with disdain. They would make jokes about him and they would think that they were magician, a healer, or a trickster. And most likely, if you lived in a royal household, you weren't really able to relate with the poor people back then. You weren't able to relate to the uncomfortable life that Jesus encountered on the road dealing with lepers, beggars, sinners. So these guys lived comfortable lives that were very unrelatable to the life of the regular person back in the day. In fact, the Jews despised this group the most. Why? Because they became co-leaders with the Romans, the Gentiles, so they could keep their comfortable way of life. So for this man to come to Jesus and ask him to save his son, we know he must have been desperate and uncomfortable. As the saying goes, God comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. You know, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't instantly heal his son because of this man's status or, or how, how desperate he, he was. Rather, Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. And I, I, I read this scripture and I was like, wait, Jesus, what are you trying to get at here? Because Jesus doesn't do anything just because he feels like it. He's doing it for a purpose. Jesus was questioning his motives. And throughout the Gospels, religious people and all these rich people would question who Jesus was and whose authority that he was doing the signs that he was doing doing so this guy though he wasn't religious i think really in it himself he was a royal family member so he most likely thought jesus was a trickster or a pretender to the throne but he was in such a desperate type of situation and he was looking for any type of solution he thought maybe jesus who was a magician or a healer rather than the son of God, could come and heal his son. But Jesus wasn't satisfied with that belief. He really wanted this man to know who we, he was, mm -hmm. to put his faith in him. Come on, come on bro. This ruler, okay. when he was seeking out Jesus, he probably thought to himself, I will believe it when I see it. But that wasn't good enough for Jesus. Jesus didn't have to prove anything to anybody. Jesus was God before we were even alive or we were even thought of. He thought of us even before the beginning of time. He was before all things and through all things. He is real whether you believe in him or not yeah. come on so what was jesus doing he knew the hearts of men he knew this man was in a desperate situation probably knew that this guy came from a sincere heart what was jesus doing he was testing him do you really believe i can do this you know it's a fair question he was surrounded by many peers that would demean 
the teachings of Jesus. He grew up believing that the people from Nazareth were illiterate country bumpkins who had no business leading people spiritually or any type of way in life. Most likely his family and those in his circle were using spiritual teachings and their status to keep their political power. Yet God put hardship in his life so he could seek Jesus. Then Jesus questions his motives. Why are you really here? You know, Jesus has that question for us this morning. Why are you really here? Yeah. Do you really trust in my power? Do you really believe what I say, I say? Do you trust in my words? See, God will allow you to go through trials to test your faith. You know, James chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Are you mature and complete this morning, brothers and sisters? Oh, come on. Come on. We're getting there. I'm, I'm getting there as well. Amen. <laughs> See? What is this verse communicating? This verse is communicating how you handle hardship and challenges mm -hmm. matters to God. Do you rely on yourself or do you rely on God's word to fill what is lacking? The Bible says that you must allow the testing to produce perseverance. How do you know you're persevering? Are you progressing every day? Are you focusing on believing more every day? Are you expanding your faith? Are you challenging yourself to grow spiritually every day? Your discipler can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself, for your relationship with God. Even when you don't see the results you want, you got to keep on pushing. Christianity can be summed up in this scripture and this next scripture that I'll share with you in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. It says, for we live, Greek word meno, to live by faith, not by sight. Do you have your spiritual glasses on this morning, church? You know, as Christians, we are going to be tested by this scripture every day. Do you live by faith or do you live by what you see in front of you? This man was tested by this scripture and he passed the test. How do we know that? Well, if he just thought that Jesus was a healer, he would have kept on pushing. Jesus to come with him to his house to see it actually happen. Rather, it says the Bible, the Bible says that he took Jesus at his word. Are you taking Jesus, Jesus at his word this morning? This morning, I want to challenge you to expand your faith. Rather than Jesus having to prove to you, that his word is real. Just believe. Believe everything that God's word says. Take Jesus's, take Jesus at his word. You know, I love Star Wars. Not the new ones, on. but the good ones. <laughs> I love... The Empire Strikes Back, all the old school ones, the, the ones that actually started the phenomenon. And uh, The Empire Strikes Back is one of my favorite movies because it's all about Luke Skywalker and his development into a hero. 
And Luke is preparing to face off Darth Vader. And um, he finds Yoda. And Yoda is this mystical Jedi master who lives in this swamp planet called Dagobah. <laughs> and I, I know I'm really nerding out here, guys. On, Some of you uh, cool people, just bear with me. Come Amen. On. Come and, on, uh, Zach. Yoda Come on, Zach. teaches him how to use the Force. And uh, what I love is, is this one particular scene. While Luke is trying to find Yoda, he gets his ship stuck into a swamp. And throughout his intense training, this ship keeps seeking more and more into the swamp. And so while he's going through some of probably the worst type of training, all these uh, incredible runs, physical tests, Think mental testing. He actually faces the worst part of himself. We can get into that later in another lesson. His final test was to get the ship out of the swamp. And uh, I Googled the actual dialogue from the scene so I wouldn't mess it up, but I changed the words so we could see it from a godlike perspective. Amen. I'm not going to do Yoda's voice. So, uh, Amen. Uh, Luke says this as his X Wing sinks into the swamp. We're never going to get it out now. Yoda says, So certain are you, always with you, it cannot be done. Wow. Hear you nothing that I say. Can you imagine Jesus saying to you this morning? Always with you, it cannot be done. Wow. Hear you nothing I say? Luke Skywalker says, Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. Wow. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Luke, he concentrates. And the X-wing, the ship, begins to rise out of the swamp. A moment later, however, it sinks the rest of the way in. With Yoda and R2-D2 both expressing disappointment. Luke Skywalker, he's breathing heavily. He says this, I can't. It's too big. Yoda says, size matters not. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? Hmm? And well, you should not. For my ally is Jesus. And a powerful ally is he. He creates life makes it grow. His spirit surrounds us. It binds us. Spiritual beings are we, not this crude matter. You must feel his power around you, everywhere, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. Luke Skywalker says, you want the impossible. He starts to walk away. Yoda sighs, then concentrates on the ship. Using the force, he raises it out of the swamp and places it safely on dry land. Lund looks back to Luke. Luke Skywalker says, I don't believe it. Yoda says, that is why you fail. Some awesome discipling Ooh. from an incredible movie. Amen. Come on. <laughs> this is why we can fail and struggle in our faith because we just don't believe. We see the obstacles and we, we think it's too big or too impossible to handle. We fail to see that the obstacle actually comes from God. It's a testing of our faith. And then we just don't take Jesus at his word. 
Why do we do this? I think it's because we have trust issues. We put our trust in so many people in our lives and they have failed us. We put our trust in dad. He failed us. We put our trust on mom. She failed us. We, we, we put all of that on our relationship with God. And all of a sudden, we have trust issues and struggle to believe God's word. But the Bible says that love never fails. And another verse in the Bible, it says that God is love. So what is the Bible communicating to us? That God's love never fails. He will never fail us. He will bail us out time and time again. Come Come on, on, Jack. What obstacle has God put in your life that you feel is impossible to overcome? Maybe God has put there, put it there to test your heart. Jesus told his disciples that anything is possible for the one who believes. I want to challenge you to do something scary, scary spiritually every week. Maybe it's sharing your faith more than you ever have ever before. Or studying the Bible with somebody that you know needs Jesus and you're afraid of the reaction. See, without tests and challenges, you will never grow. It's what closes the distance between impossible and what is possible. Maybe you're like, I agree with you, Zach. I believe God can do anything, but I don't believe God can use someone like me, which leads me to my second point. Anyone can change. Let's continue on here in verse 51. Come on, Zach. While this is the royal official, while he was still on the way, his servants met with him with the news that his boy was living. When you, he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. I mean, this miracle was incredible. Not only because Jesus healed, completely healed this boy, but it was at the exact time Jesus said it would happen. And he wasn't even there. But what was even more incredible is his entire household was healed spiritually. And what was even more amazing, it's all because one man accepted Jesus at his word. Faith not only can change you, but it can change your entire family as well. As we've looked at, this man had no business believing in Jesus. But as we look at all the countless examples in the Bible, God can change anyone. Let's look here in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Coming in Come for a landing, guys. Are you not, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor idolaters, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. You know, Paul is talking to this church in Corinth and telling them they were once enslaved by their sin. And because of that, they couldn't inherit the kingdom of God. And he's reminding them of who they were before and who they are now, that they were washed in the blood of Jesus. And they can live a new life. See, Jesus 
can take anyone and change them. And if you don't believe me, just turn on your screen and look at your screen. Look at your face. Think about who you were before you came to Jesus. You know, we have some amazing stories of change in the church, of ch people changed by Jesus. I myself, I was an immoral person. I was a liar. I was an idolater before I became a Christian. Jesus changed me. Every single one of us has an amazing story of why we are in the church. You must remember who you were before you became a disciple. We have Keenan Bowman, who was a track star, whose injuries derailed his career. And by the grace of God, he went to his school because of those injuries, and he met disciples. My wife, Brittany, was this sorority girl from Tri-Cities who had to travel to Washington, to Portland to become a disciple. You have Stephanie Wilson, who baptized her mom, Lynn Pangra. And both have persevered through so much to be here with us today. Come on. Particularly, Heidi's story has moved me. Because I, I, I think about my sister. And, and um, you know, just to see Heidi's perseverance and her reliance on God through terrible situation. Uh, it just moves my heart because, you know, my sister has been through very similar circumstances. I had calls at 12 o'clock at night, her sobbing, her, her dealing with emotional and physical abuse, and finally deciding to leave her husband in the middle of the night because he got drunk. And that was a very scary situation for me. And it was even more scarier because my sister didn't have the kingdom of God in her life to help her, to support her. And uh, we're just so grateful for you, Heidi. Your story is so inspiring. And we're proud of your perseverance. Yeah, I'm so proud of Gary Gordon. He's such an incredible man. You know, this man has lived some life. I mean, he grew up during the 60s. I don't know if you can tell by his hair. You know, he's had an incredible life where he's raised two boys on his own as a single dad. Come on, Gary. And he would be the first one to admit that he wasn't always perfect. He did struggle with addiction issues. And yet, through the power of God's word, he became your brother in Christ. And I, I love him very much. I call him about once a week. And, and he's just someone I can talk to for 30 minutes and just get blown away about his care and love for God and his people. You know, Gary had his first friend out to Bible talk this week. And prayerfully, his friend will study the Bible soon. Oh, come on, Gary. Yeah. And now Gary has big dreams of starting a fishing ministry where we'll not only fish for fish, on, but we're also going to fish for men. Amen. <laughs> See, anyone can change. All you need is to take Jesus at his word and have a humble heart. Today, let's make a decision to take Jesus at his word, to believe that faith closes the distance, to believe that anyone can change. And when you believe it, you will see it. You'll see the church change, the city of Eugene change, and the world change for Jesus Christ. I love you all, and to God be all the glory.